good afternoon. Thank you guys um, so much for having the Mariners Museum come and uh, represent and talk about Blackbeard, um, a great subject of mine. I'm definitely a pirate fan. Um, so my name is Mrs. Brandon Adams, and I'm the senior educator for history here at the Mariners Museum in Park. So usually I end up uh, spending most of my time with third and fifth graders, so it's nice to have um, a different audience. So today we're going to be talking about Blackbeard in the Americas, the man, the myth, and the legend. Um, and for uh, Hampton Public Libraries, if they have uh, questions or anything, are we going to hold them till the end um, or asking throughout the presentation? Uh, whatever you're most comfortable with. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So our journey is going to start back in the spring of 1995. Um, I was a third grader at Virginia Beach City Public Schools. I went to Kimsville Elementary School. Um, and during this time, their curriculum um, for social studies consisted of students learning about um, history of Virginia Beach. So we learned about the Norwegian lady, which you can find down um, at the ocean front. We talked about the Francis Land House, the Adam Thurgood House, which is now the Thurgood House. Um, and we talked about Blackbeard. So that was my first introduction of learning about this pirate. Um, so in third grade, um, at the end of the year, they always had a pirate day celebration. Uh, students got to dress up. We went on a treasure hunt. There was lots of fun going on. There were costumes. There were uh, people coming and interpreting, talking about Blackbeard. So that was my first introduction of this pirate. Um, and here is a lovely picture of me all dressed up um, for Pirate Day during that time. Now, I became fascinated with pirates, not necessarily just Blackbeard, but just pirates in general and how us as a society have kind of taken this uh, group of mostly gentlemen and kind of romanticize them, looking at them living life on the high seas. But what I'm here to try and tell you is that pirates were not to be messed with. They were terrible people. Um, we're gonna go through talking about one specific being Blackbeard, um, but how we just kind of romanticize them even to this day. They're still fascinating for people all over the world. So fast forward to 1998, um, and at the Mariner, uh, at the Mariners Museum, they had an exhibition on pirates called Under the Black Flag. Um, and one of the pieces that they had on display was this skull right here, claiming to be a skull of Blackbeard. Now, I talked to exhibitors um, about this piece, and they said, actually, there's really no way to authenticate if this skull was actually Blackbeard's or not. They actually said it was much smaller, so it's probably the skull of a female and not male, um, and there was no way to authenticate it, but it was a piece for discussion. Um, and this display or this exhibit came roughly 280 years after Blackbeard dies, and yet people are still fascinated with pirates and Blackbeard in general because he did have a presence here in the Hampton Roads area. Um, and so that's what we're gonna look at, talking about his life, um, how he came about, what we know about him, what we don't know about him, um, and then talking about his legacy that lives on. So the first thing is where do we as historians get our information from? Um, and a lot of it comes from this book right here, A General History of the Pirates um, by a man named Captain Charles Johnson. Now he is writing these books during the time of when Blackbeard was present, so in the early 1700s. But a lot of what he writes He's an author, he's trying to sell books. So as we'll see when he updates his information in these different editions, a lot of things specifically about Blackbeard tend to change. Um, but you'll see chapter three is dedicated to Captain Teach or Blackbeard. We'll talk about his name in just a bit. Um, but we have to kind of take it with a grain of salt because everything about Blackbeard that we know comes from this source but this source could possibly be inaccurate. So we got to talk about this guy, this Blackbeard character. Um, one thing historians look at is who this person was. We don't even know what his actual name was. Most historians are in agreement that his name was Edward Teach or some variation that you see over here. So Edward Teach or Edward Thatch is presented a lot in newspapers of the time. 
With that being said, there are some historians, one um, Robert E. Lee, who wrote about Blackbeard, and he suggests that um, Edward or Blackbeard's name was Edward Drummond. Now, Drummond would have been a Scottish last name, and so therefore Blackbeard would have had a thick Scottish accent, but there's no um, information saying that Blackbeard had a Scottish accent. So the fact that his name was Edward Drummond, probably not. There's also been new recent developments within the uh, last few years that um, Blackbeard's last name or Blackbeard's name was Edward Beard. Um, and this comes from the North Carolina Maritime Museum in Beaufort, North Carolina. Um, again, it's a recent development, a recent theory. I haven't found much on it, but they're suggesting that his name was Edward Beard. For this presentation, I'm going to refer to Blackbeard as Blackbeard or Edward Teach. Teach, that's what we'll go with um, since most historians are in agreement. So we don't really know what this guy's actual name was. We're guessing on this. And with that, we don't know where this person was born. Again, a lot of it is guesswork. Most historians, again, are in agreement that he was born somewhere in Bristol, England, um, around 1680. Um, with that being said, there are other historians that believe he was born somewhere in the Caribbean islands. Um, there's another gentleman in the 1900s who suggested um, he was from Virginia. He suggested that Blackbeard was born in Accomack County. Again, we're not entirely sure. Um, most historians like to tend to agree that he was born sometime in, around 1680 in Bristol, England. Um, there's a Bristol legend that claims that Teach's father was a privateersman during the Dutch Wars, returning to Bristol before, 18, or before 1680, the time when Teach would have been born. So there's that going around, people saying he was born in the Caribbean, people saying he was born in Accomack County, Virginia. We're not entirely sure. We're gonna go with Bristol, England, <clears throat> um, but again, we're not entirely sure. So how does this gentleman, this man, how does he get into piracy? Um, again, it's a little bit of guesswork. He doesn't necessarily write out how he gets into piracy. Um, but during this time, we have the War of Spanish Succession going on or Queen Anne's War. And according to author uh, Angus Costum, suggests that Teach probably fought in the War of Spanish Succession. Teach would have been hired as a privateer. Um, a privateer was hired during times of war with a letter of mark from their government to plunder enemy vessels and return to their home country with the goods. Now, privateers were very similar to pirates. Uh, Teach probably served as a privateer sometime during the war. However, with peace between the countries and the signing of a treaty, uh, Constant suggests that upwards of 40,000 British and Dutch seamen were out of a job. So with the war coming to an end, you have these people, these men who were privateers, who allowed their government, their government allowed them to go and plunder enemy ships, bringing back the goods to their country. With the war over, because that's now what they know how to do, a life of piracy kind of seems to be the place that they're going to go. Um, so with this suggestion, not only are there British men, but Dutch men as well, who are out, out of a job. Pri uh, piracy, piracy <laughs> seems to be the place to go to because it's very similar to privateering. The only difference is you're not getting permission from the government to go and plunder enemy vessels. You plunder whatever you want. And that's what's going to be the difference between privateering and piracy. So pirates of the Caribbean or where these pirates are going to hang out will be in the Caribbean islands. It's probably the reason why we have the movie Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, so pirate, uh, privateersmen, privateersmen uh, would switch to being pirates and they needed some place, a hideout to go. The Caribbean, specifically the Bahamas, which you see right here, um, is going to be the capital of the pirate world in the new world. Um, the islands were largely uninhabited um, because they were so clustered together. It was a great hideout for them. Um, and Edward Teach is going to go to the Bahamas. Um, the first time he appears in any record is in 1760. 
Um, according to an author, the islands were, quote, lawless, empty, and ungoverned. So therefore, it is a perfect hangout for these pirates, for these jobless men. Um, and there's a reason why the Bahamas become important for when these pirates want to plunder in, uh, plunder ships. So I have a quote that I'm going to read here of why these islands right here were a really good hangout for the pirates. For a few brief years, New Providence would also become the pirate capital of the New World. The island sat on the edge of the relatively narrow Bahama Channel and the Florida Straits, each less than 100 miles away, miles wide. Given a radius of visibility of 20 miles on a clear day, two or three pirate ships working just within sight of each other could cover most of the channel, ensuring they stood a good chance of encountering any ships that fell into their net. Both passages were the preferred route for ships heading home to Europe and for the growing number of smaller vessels en route between the Caribbean and the British colonies of North America. So just having two or three ships working in this area any type of merchant ship that's coming in, the pirate ships would be able to capture. So pirate capital world in the early 1700s is going to be the Caribbean islands, going to be the Bahamas. So like I said, the first um, information that we have on Teach comes in 1716. Um, he is in the Bahamas and he meets a guy named Benjamin Hornigold. Hornigold was also a privateersman who was now turned to piracy. And Hornigold decides to take Teach on and mentor him, show him how to be a captain, show him how to use the necessary equipment, how to read charts, how to steer a ship, all the tools that you would need to become a successful pilot, uh, pirate. And with Benjamin Hornigold, he ends up taking on Teach and Teach loves it. He's fantastic at wanting to plunder different types of ships, wanting to steal cargo, um, terrorize different people. He ends up enjoying being a pirate. But it also goes back to talking about pi uh, privateersmen of what they were used to during the um, Spanish, the war of Spanish succession. So with that, um, Benjamin Hornigold and Edward Teach, he teaches them um, what to do, but ultimately Edward Teach wants to be his own pirate. He doesn't want to continue being on the crew with uh, Benjamin Hornigold. So they do end up separating their ways. With Edward Teach now being on his own, he needs a pirate ship. So behind me, we have a representation of the La Concorde. This was a slave ship that Edward Teach is able to capture um, on November 28, 1717. Um, because it was a slave ship, it could carry 515 enslaved people. When Edward Teach captures this, he turns it into, quote, a maritime fortress, carries up to 40 guns, and receives a new name, the Queen Anne's Revenge. Um, this is an artist representation. This um, can be found at the uh, Maritime Museum in Beaufort. Um, it depicts what it would have looked like. We're not entirely sure what it would have looked like, um, but based on the records that we do have, this is our best representation. So Everteach now has a ship. He's going to need um, to learn how to become a pirate. And he was able to do that with Benjamin Hornigold being his mentor. So it's kind of a misconception that pirates are dumb, or at least pirate captains. Um, pirate captains, because you have to know how to steer a ship, you don't have to read maps and charts, you know, uh, have to know how to navigate the waters, especially in and around uh, the Outer Banks of North Carolina, which is where Edward Teach spent a lot of his time um, so therefore, Edward Teach was very well educated, um, whether he learned that from Benjamin Hornigold or when he was a privateersman during the war, not entirely sure, but he knew how to use these different types of tools. If you have to navigate, especially in and around um, the barrier islands of North Carolina, and this will come into play in just a few minutes, 
He knew how to navigate. The sandbars are always changing. It continues to this day. The currents are always different. Um, and this is what's called the graveyard of the Atlantic because there's so many shipwrecks in and around North Carolina. So it is a misconception that pirates are dumb or uneducated. Um, at least for Edward Teach, we know that he was. Um, based on records, he kept a library on the Queen Anne's Revenge, so he knew how to read, he knew how to write, um, and using these navigational tools, he would have been able to use those as well. So how do we get from Teach to Blackbeard? How does he become this man that we know based on his appearance? Um, well, it's kind of obvious the way of uh, his looks is what's going to help him determine his namesake. Um, the first record of Blackbeard being mentioned as Blackbeard or, or talking about his beard um, comes from a, a man named Henry Bodstock. Um, his description says Captain Thatch <clears throat> was a tall, spare man with a very black beard, which he wore very long. That's the first time that we have mention of this black beard. It's a very simple type of description, but the name kind of sticks. Um, Henry Bodstock was actually held captive for eight hours in the Caribbean islands um, when uh, Blackbeard was going around when Edward Teach was going around and causing chaos. Um, this program is going to focus mostly on what uh, Blackbeard was doing up and down the East Coast, so South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. But he went all over. He went, um, I think, as far north as uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia. He went to Honduras, Belize, all across uh, back and forth with the Yucatan Peninsula and Mexico back and forth in the Caribbean. So he made a lot of journeys, um, but we're gonna focus on what he was doing here in the colonies. So that's the first time that we have Blackbeard mentioned or his Blackbeard being mentioned. And then many types of historians have kind of analyzed what Blackbeard looked like and how he used his black beard to entice fear. So I have a few quotes that I wanted to read based on different authors. Um, one is author Mark P. Donnelly and Daniel Deal. He states his tall frame and powerful physique contributed to his fearful appearance, made all the more menacing by a long coal black beard, which before action he plaited into small pigtails tied with colored ribbons. Into these, he braided slow burning fuses, pieces of cordite ordin <clears throat> ordinarily used to touch off cannons. The wisps of smoke curling out from beneath his cocked hat and around his face greatly increased his devilish look. Um, uh, author Angus Constant also notes that his ferocious appearance and reputation were enough to encourage most merchant captains to surrender. Clearly, he understood that intimidation was a major tool in pirate arsenal. So where we look at pirates, where the majority of them are going on board, fighting, killing people, capturing people, Blackbeard mainly used his looks. He used it for intimidation purposes. He's kind of the equivalent to modern day terrorists. Um, you would see him and you would automatically be frightened. Now, this picture is great with the whiffs of smoke coming around him. It kind of looks like the devil himself. If he's to step on board on your ship and you see him, you're going to be extremely scared. He was also a very tall man. Some workers say that he was over six feet tall. So extremely large, looks like the devil himself. People, merchants um, are very scared of this man. Um, and it's going to be his looks that kind of give him his trademark of what he's doing, of how he's able to capture and plunder enemy ships. So back to our author, to our contemporary author, um, who wrote uh, the general history of the pirates, uh, Captain Charles Johnson. His first edition makes a representation of Mr. Blackbeard looking like this. Now, you'll notice he has the sword, he has the guns, but what's different is he has a fur cap. And when he updates his second edition, he changes it to be more accurate of Black Bear looking like this. Now, this is the first edition of his book. This is the second edition. The reason I point this out is I told you a lot of the stuff that we, a lot of the information that we get comes from this book. 
But Charles Johnson was there to sell books. He was there to make bestsellers. And so having Captain Blackbeard with a fur hat is not as piratey, at least in our mindsets today even, of him just wearing a tricorn hat. So this updated version is probably historically inaccurate. Blackbeard probably wore something more like this with the fur cap versus the tricorn hat, even though even today we associate pirates looking more like this. Um, so something just to keep in mind of why us historians don't always believe what was written, um, even though it was during the time period of when Blackbeard <clears throat> was around. So Blackbeard has his ship, he has his Queen Anne's Revenge, he has his trademark. Now we gotta talk about his flag. His flag is a little controversial as well because there's no mention of Blackbeard's flag until 1900s. So well over uh, 200 years after his death. Um, but according to documents, um, Blackbeard had a flag that had the skeleton of the devil here holding right up here, holding a um, uh, hourglass and then piercing the heart right here. Some historians interpret this to be that the devil is holding an hourglass saying that the victim's time is running out. And so if you were to be on the high seas and you see this flag hoisted, you knew you were in trouble. Uh, pirates during this day, they did have certain flags that meant different things. The skull and crossbones is kind of the uh, more piratey ones that we are familiar with, but each pirate did have their own type of flag. The reason this is kind of controversial is because it comes in 1912 when someone says Blackbeard had a flag that looks like this. We're not entirely sure. He probably did have a flag if this is what it looked like. Again, it's a lot of guesswork, um, but pirates during this time did have flags. Pirates also played dirty because they would have different flags of different countries. So they might be sailing the flags of Spain or the flags of France, the flags of England until they get close enough to a ship where they will pull that flag down and then raise up their own pirate flag, letting the ship know that they're getting ready to be attacked by pirates. So we have Mr. Blackbeard, we have his namesake, we have, he has his looks down, he has his ship, he has his flag. He is ready to go wreak some havoc on the Atlantic waters. And the first place he decides to go or one of the first places where he's going to wreak some havoc is in Charlestown, South Carolina, which today is Charleston, South Carolina, but back in the 1700s, they uh, called it Charlestown. Now, Charlestown was more of a well-established uh, colony during this time versus North Carolina and Virginia, and that will come into importance in just a little bit. Um, but during this time, Blackbeard, uh, one of his more brazen acts was to actually blockade the harbor in and out of Charlestown, South Carolina. For 10 days, he, with three ships and roughly 300 men, would not let anyone go into the harbor or out of the harbor. Um, and with that, anybody trying to go in or out, they were kidnapped. When that happens, he now has all these people that he can hold hostage. Um, he demands something for these people's return. Now, because Charlestown is a well-established colony, he could have wanted money, he could have wanted goods, um, spices possibly, maybe some rum, um, different types of alcohol. But the only thing he requests during this time is medicine. It's the only thing that he wants. And so you say, why would he want some type of medicine? Well, has to do with probably Blackbeard and his crew getting some type of venereal diseases that were very common down in the Bahamas. Now, prior to Blackbeard coming to Charlestown, um, him and his crew had spent a great deal of time in the Bahamas. And story goes, they probably caught syphilis from the prostitutes that were down in the Bahamas. Now behind me are some medicinal tools that were recovered through archeological excavation on what they believe to be the Queen Anne's Revenge, um, the shipwreck right outside um, the coast of Beaufort, North Carolina. So behind me, this right here is a urethral syringe. 
and this would be the needle right here. Um, mercury was used to relieve syphilis during this time. And so with the pirates um, having this issue, they would request this um, and use it. Now, this being found at the shipwreck, it's a good possibility that it possibly is the Queen Anne's Revenge. Um, we'll talk more about that in a little while. Um, but this is what they requested. No money, no spices, no alcohol. They just wanted some uh, medicinal uh, purposes to relieve their issues. So when the blockade happens, the other colonies, um, specifically Virginia, start to get extremely nervous. Um, because South Carolina is a more established colony and Blackbeard was able to blockade the harbor for 10 days, uh, Virginia is nervous. Um, same with North Carolina as well. They're a little nervous with this going on. Um, the governor of Virginia during this time is Alexander Spotswood. Um, and he wants to get rid of the Blackbeard problem. Um, I'm only going through certain issues that Blackbeard caused. Again, he was all over the place going up to parts of uh, Philadelphia. He was causing some major issues. And with the blockade at Charlestown, people started to get very worried. Could this happen to our colony as well? So Alexander Spotswood, he's seeing what Blackbeard's doing and he's not happy about it. He wants something to be done. For Blackbeard, he has been looting and plundering different places. And so now he decides that he wants to go to certain parts of North Carolina. But with that, he can't take the Queen Anne's revenge. So in 1718, um, in the summer of 1718, for whatever reason, as he's navigating, the Queen Anne's revenge gets stuck and ultimately sinks off the coast of Beaufort, North Carolina. Now with that happening, um, because Blackbeard had other ships with them, um, they go onto the other ships, but some men have to be stationed on some of the outlining uh, uh, islands off the coast while Blackbeard makes his way up to North Carolina. Now, I told you a few moments ago that he was very well versed with how the barrier islands um, how he was able to navigate through them. He knew what to do. The fact that he ran aground, he probably did it on purpose because that way he had to leave some of his crew on the islands um, out off the coast. He gets to go with a smaller crew. He has a smaller ship now with him and he's taking all the stuff that they looted and they plundered. They're he's taking that with them and he's leaving some of his crew um, on the islands. So many historians and myself believe that he probably did this on purpose. Um, he was educated enough to know how to navigate in and around the barrier islands. He probably did this, which is a total piratey thing to do, to be able to plunder, get rid of some of your crew, so now you don't have to share as much of the stuff that you have. So very piratey thing to do, probably did this on purpose, but the sinking of the Queen Anne's Revenge does happen. So Mr. Blackbeard is going to make his way up to North Carolina. It's a perfect hangout. Again, he's got the barrier islands. Um, and during this time, the governor of North Carolina, Charles Eden, so named after Edenton, that's where you get the uh, name Edenton, North Carolina. Charles Eden has decided to issue pardons to anyone who needs them. Blackbeard and his crew say, hey, this is a great thing. We can go. We can get a pardon. We can still have the stuff that we have, but we will get a pardon. And that's exactly what they do. So Blackbeard and his men, they go into North Carolina, uh, parts of Bath, North Carolina, where Charles Eden issues a pardon for Blackbeard and his crew. So because there's a pardon now, Virginia can't do anything initially. Um, Blackbeard is true to his word. He stops pirating for a whopping three months. Um, so three months into his pardon, he comes uh, back into town and he has this ship with him. It's a French ship. It's full of sugar, full of different types of spices, different types of uh, goods. 
And when people ask, where did this ship come from? He said, oh, I was sailing out and it was just abandoned. And so I needed to take it back. Nobody's going to question him because it's Blackbeard. People are scared of him. And there are no other witnesses except for his crew. And they're going to vouch saying, yeah, it was an abandoned ship that had lots of sugar, things like that. So he has gone back to his pirating ways, um, but he can't prove it. So even though he said he found this ship that was out there in the middle of the Atlantic, probably not. Um, so he has gone back to his pirating ways. That is going to allow the governor of Virginia, Alexander Spotswood, to say, we need to take care of this Blackbeard problem. So to quote um, a newspaper of the day, Governor Spotswood issues a proclamation stating for Edward Teach, commonly called Captain Teach or Blackbeard, I will give 100 pounds. Um, he advises Lieutenant Robert Maynard to go hunt down Blackbeard and his crew and to bring Blackbeard back to Virginia, dead or alive. And so Lieutenant Robert Maynard, that is what he is tasked with. Um, Robert Mayer, uh, Lieutenant Robert Mayer leaves with two ships and they go sailing to North Carolina. The issue here is that the colony of Virginia now looks like it's attacking the colony of North Carolina. Um, you gotta remember during this time, there's still colonies. And even though Blackbeard has been pardoned, Virginia kind of needs to stay out of this, at least from a political standpoint. Um, but Governor Spotswood wants to take care of the Blackbeard problem. Many historians kind of debate if this was a good move um, for the governor of Virginia. Um, some say he did this for political reasons, that he was looking for popularity with his politics. And so if he was the one to get rid of the Blackbeard issue, then he would be popular with his politics. Did it work out? We'll find out. So on November 22nd, 1718, we have Lieutenant Mayor and Blackbeard meeting for the first time and the final time. Um, Robert Maynor makes his way down to North Carolina. They know that he's hiding out there somewhere in the Barrier Islands. Um, and they meet right off the coast of Ocracoke Island. Got this great summary to read to you of how the battle takes place. So on November 22nd, 1718, near Ocracoke Island, Blackbeard and Lieutenant Maynard met. Maynard claimed Blackbeard, quote, drank damnation to me and my men and called us cowardly puppies. Blackbeard would show no mercy. Blackbeard hoisted his flag, as did the British. Robert Maynard told his men, we cannot escape the pirates and we must fight or be killed. At that point, Blackbeard opened fire, killing six of Maynard's men and wounding 10. As the fighting continued, Lieutenant Maynard orders some of his crew below deck to wait for Blackbeard to board the ship. As he comes aboard, Blackbeard is caught off guard. There are few dead soldiers and hardly any blood on the decks. On his order, Lieutenant Maynard's soldiers rush the deck for a surprise attack. Blackbeard and Maynard come face to face. Fighting ensues, and according to Charles Johnson, Blackbeard, quote, fights with great fury. Blackbeard is wounded multiple times, 20 sword wounds and five bullet wounds. Maynard and his men move in for the kill. To quote the newspaper of the time, quote, one of Maynard's men engaged Teach with his broadsword, who gave Teach a cut to the neck. Teach saying, well done, lad. The man replied, if it be not well done, I'll do it better. And with that gave him a second stroke, which cut off his head, laying it flat on his shoulder. Once Blackbeard is killed, the remaining pirates quickly surrender because their pirate captain has been killed and they have no one else uh, to call the orders. They have no other leader. Now, Blackbeard's head is going to be cut off from his body. He is decapitated. Um, proof for Governor Spotswood that Blackbeard has been taken care of. Um, and also 
a threat to other pirates saying Virginia colony does not tolerate this. Um, Robert Maynard captures the remaining pirates who um, did not die during the battle and escorts them to the Williamsburg jail where they will await trial um, and be hanged publicly. Um, Blackbeard's head is hung on Maynard's ship right here um, as they make their way back to Virginia. When they return, Blackbeard's head is displayed on a spike uh, in between the Hampton and James Rivers, and that place today is still known as Blackbeard's Point. Um, with you all being in Hampton, I assume, and me being here in Newport News, it's just down the road, um, and it's still called Blackbeard's Point. Um, that was used as a warning to other pirates who going into the James River or out into the Chesapeake Bay, they would see this and know that, hey, Colony of Virginia was able to take down Blackbeard. This is something that we don't want to mess with. We don't uh, want Virginia to do that to us. So in a nutshell, that is what we know about Blackbeard. Um, there are some stories of what he was doing in the Caribbean, what he was doing in other colonies. But there's more myths and legends that we know about Blackbeard versus what we actually know about fact. Um, so here are just a few. There's actually no reports of him actually killing anyone up until his battle with uh, Lieutenant Mayor. Um, there's no real issues or no real uh, record of him actually killing anyone. Um, he used his looks, his fears and intimidation with his looks, and that's how people uh, gave him what he wanted. Um, there's also this myth that he had 14 wives. Um, records don't necessarily say how many wives he had. Um, there is one report that he had um, a wife who was only 16 years old. Um, again, this comes from Captain Johnson. Could be a little sensational um, with the information. Um, he writes, Teach invited five or six of his more brutish companions to come ashore and force his wife to prostitute herself on each of them one after another while the men laughed and drank and watched. Now, with um, uh, Captain Johnson, what we've looked at, we've seen his pictures of how he's updating his information. Um, we're not entirely sure if that is true. This is the only source that says that he had a wife that was 16 years old. So it could be sensationalized. Um, one final story is with one of his crewmen named Israel Hand. So Israel Hand was a crew member. And for whatever reason, Blackbeard shoots him in the kneecap, leaving him lame for life. And when asked why he did that, um, Blackbeard said, quote, if he did not now and then kill one of them, they would forget who he was. On top of that, if you are from this area and you know anything about Blackbeard, um, you'll know that when he was decapitated and they threw his body overboard, there's a saying go that his body swam around the ship multiple times before sinking into the water. That was something that we actually learned in third grade with Pirate Day, something that we learned about Blackbeard. We did learn that his body may have circled the ship several times. So a lot of information on ma uh, myths and legends versus what we actually know. And with that, Blackbeard leaves behind a huge legacy. Now for this guy being dead for over 300 years, he has a lot of things that represent him. So behind me are just a few. We've got, we've got Legos, we've got board games, we've got trading cards. He's kind of everywhere. Um, this right here actually comes from our collection. Um, this is an action figure of Blackbeard equipped with a sword that has been bloodied. Uh, he's got his tricorn hat, even though we talked about it probably should be a fur cap. Um, but this is an action figure, roughly 2004. And then there are also restaurants that talk about or that the theme is Blackbeard. So Blackbeard's Slices and Ices can be found in Bath, North Carolina. And then Blackbeard's Restaurant right here can be found in um, Beaufort, North Carolina. There's also a lot of pop culture 
that goes with Mr. Blackbeard. Um, this is what I could find in terms of, let's get out of the way here, um, in terms of what Blackbeard has, um, has done with pop culture. So talked about the restaurants. Besides the restaurants being in North Carolina, there are restaurants dedicated to Blackbeard in Spain, Bermuda, Georgia, Florida, Texas, and Belize. There's also a Blackbeard's Rum Cakes that can be found in the Grand Cayman Islands. There have been movies made, literature written. There's actually a poem by the famous Benjamin Franklin that talks about Blackbeard. Podcasts, art, board games, documentaries, museums or museum exhibits, souvenirs. We've got our action figure. We've got our rum, which I heard goes really well with Coke. Um, and video games, Assassin's Creed is very popular with the younger crowd. I've not played Assassin's Creed, but there is one character that is modeled after Blackbeard. Um, and there are many Blackbeard ghost walks that you can find in North Carolina and other parts. There's also many Hampton Roads attractions. The Blackbeard Pirate Festival actually just happened this past weekend. Um, June 4th and 5th was the Blackbeard Pirate Festival that happens in Hampton. Um, to Hang a Pirate is a court case that Colonial Williamsburg puts on um, at different times. Um, it has to be age appropriate as well. We have Capital Landing Road also found in Williamsburg. And these were, um, this was the road where uh, Blackbeard's crew were hanged for their trial um, after they were tried and found guilty. That's where they were hanged. Um, and then we've already talked about Blackbeard's point between the Hampton and the James River. So just here in the local Hampton Roads area, we have these different things that remind us of Blackbeard. And so one final thing that we're going to talk about is the Queen Anne's Revenge. Um, so Recently, um, there's been a discovery recently, 1996, um, near Beaufort, North Carolina, off the coast, that claims to be the Queen Anne's Revenge. Um, based on some of the artifacts that have, have been brought up, such as the syringe and the needle that I showed you, um, it suggests that this possibly could have been the Queen Anne's Revenge. They've been able to do some data analysis, and the record, it does fit with um, the Queen Anne's Revenge. The only thing is, like other ships that would be stamped with their logo, the Queen Anne's Revenge didn't have that. So anything that they bring up is not going to have Queen Anne's Revenge on it um, because it was a pirate ship. They were trying to hide that they were pirates. Um, but this marker is found uh, very close to the Fort Mason State Park. Um, so this right here is actually a Civil War um, moat uh, defense that's in Beaufort, North Carolina. And then out here, it's difficult to see, but there's a buoy. Now the buoy doesn't signify where the shipwreck is, but the buoy is very close to where they say um, this shipwreck is. Um, it's about one and a half miles off the coast of North Carolina. And with that, um, Blackbeard has recently been in the news. Um, in November of 2019, Blackbeard and his ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, made news um, in regards to the images and videos that a company called Nautilus Productions was taking. Um, so this company was suing the state of North Carolina um, for using their videos and their photography on the state website. Um, it claimed that it was an issue of copyright. And so North Carolina um, was using the images and citing that they have a Blackbeard's Law. And there is a Blackbeard's Law, and this is what it says. All photographs, video recordings, or other documentary materials of a vessel or shipwreck, or its contents, relics, artifacts, or historic materials in the custody of any agency of North Carolina government or its subdivisions shall be a public record. Now, when they stated this Blackbeard's Law, um, both the production company and the state of North Carolina decided to bring it all the way up to the Supreme Court. And recently, the Supreme Court did rule in favor of North Carolina. 
Um, the Supreme Court said that some individual cannot sue a state for copyright infringement. Um, and that decision was made in March of 2020. Now, that comes over 300 years after Blackbeard has died, and he is still causing issues, causing trouble in and around the, uh, the uh, area of North Carolina. Um, so with that, I am happy to take any questions that you have. I see that we do have um, about 10 minutes left, um, but I'd love to answer any of your questions. I didn't see in the chat if there were, but I can pop that up real quick. If you'd like to uh, type a question in the chat, or I, I suppose it's fine if you like to unmute as well. I have a question. Sure. Does that the laws improve for for part? You're breaking up a little bit. Can I get that repeated one more time? The law, you know, for Blackbeard's laws, is that laws laws? Does that have anything to do with the Pirates of the Caribbean movie? Oh, does it have anything to do with the Pirates of the Caribbean? The I franchise. Yeah, I don't believe so. I think actually Blackbeard's Law was something that North Carolina cited saying that they had... And Assassin's Creed. Oh, for Assassin's Creed? And yeah, those, those stuff. Oh, it might. Um, I am not a big video game person, so when I was doing this research, I typed in anything Blackbeard, and Assassin's Creed did come up. So that's where I think they get the image of one of the characters. They modeled it after Blackbeard. Just curious. No, that's good. Anybody else have any questions? Or in the chat? Well, you know, I have a question. What is your favorite Blackbeard fact? Um, well, I don't know if it's a fact, but... <laughs> The most interesting is um, probably that he swam around the ship several times before um, sinking into the water. I just remember that being a thing that we learned about in when I was in third grade. And it was, I don't, I don't know. I was just kind of fascinated by that. Um, the fact that he was able to blockade Charlestown for 10 days and that he wanted medicine, he could have gotten anything. That's pretty interesting. I mean, he could have, he could have captured the whole town and took what he wanted, but he just wanted medicine. So I, I find that to be interesting. Anybody else have any questions? Well, before we do head out, I do want to thank everyone um, who participated. Um, like I said, I'm used to looking at uh, fifth graders and third graders all day. So it looks like my audience was a wide range of uh, different groups. So I do thank you guys for um, listening to my talk today. Um, if you do have any questions, um, I can be reached at the Mariners Museum. I can actually put my uh, information in there for everyone. Thank you, please do. Uh, I've also included a couple of links in the chat if anybody else is interested in uh, any other programming from the North Hampton Branch Library. I've got a link to our Facebook where we usually post things. Uh, our next actual program with the Mariners Museum will be Sirens and Shipwrecks this July. Ooh. I included a link to that if you guys want to check that out or sign up. And then additionally, a link to the Hampton Public Library's Eventbrite where you guys all signed up for this event. All right, perfect. Well, thank you guys so much for having um, the Mariners Museum. We appreciate doing these programs. Thank you. Mm -hmm.